Hello there, my dear video watcher. Welcome back to the Kerbal Space Program. There's a bit of a difference with this video, obviously, as you can tell by the look on my dumb face as the audio coming to your headphones does not sync up with whatever he's saying. This is all post-commentated, and there's a very good reason for that, and the reason was there's approximately five hours of footage, and five hours of footage is not an editing task that I wish to undertake, and plus, it's five hours of very unproductive footage. This was one of those times when you just really want to hammer something out, and it really doesn't want to be hammered out, and so you just keep trying, and you just keep trying, and I want to include this you know, in the archives. I don't want to gloss over these failures and just say, hey, you know, I did a thing and here's a booster I made. No, I want to show you um, the full process, just in a little bit more of a easily digestible format. So today, we are going to discuss the lovely engineering problem of a fully reusable booster. Now, there's plenty of YouTubers out there who have made really good videos in KSP or otherwise on reusable boosters, and obviously in reality, we have SpaceX as kind of the shining model of reusability at the moment, although there are plenty of other companies, Rocket Lab comes to mind with their, uh, what's it called, Electron Rocket? God damn it, I should have checked that. I knew that right, in the, uh, right up until the moment that my brain tried to recall it, at which point I suddenly became uncertain. Yes, there are other companies doing reusable rockets. And NASA, even, had somewhat reusable, in heavy quotation marks, uh, parts at least, on, say, the space shuttle. More refurbishable than reusable, and the amount of refurbish that those boosters required was absolutely insane, um, and it basically ended up, I think, maybe being cheaper to just build them from scratch. So, take that with a pinch of salt. But no, we are talking about fully reusable, and in KSP terms, that means we want to land the craft in its entirety, eventually, back on Kerbin, and be able to recover it, such that in our kind of roleplay mindset, we can assume it was just used again for our next launch. Whatever payload we may want to put on top of there. So there's a few requirements for a reusable booster. Um, it wants to be able to lift a hefty payload, because what good is a rocket that can't actually get what you want to space, to space? And so, to begin with, my attempts uh, began on the kind of 23, I think, maybe 21 ton payloads. And quickly, I realized I wanted much more than that, so progressed up to a 75 ton payload. And quickly realized the rocket I had made was not capable of that, and so back down to a 50 ton payload. Uh, which is a pretty usable kind of mass in Kerbal Space Program. There's, there's a lot you can do with parts up to 50 tons each. So, how does a reusable rocket fly? It it uses rocket engines, Harvey. No, 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 I know that. I'm asking what kind of flight profile should a reusable rocket take? Because if we return to SpaceX, to the Falcon rockets, there's, say, on uh, Falcon 9, is it? Which is the Falcon rocket that has the two boosters and the main core, the main center core? Regardless, SpaceX, a lot of their launches go up, and two boosters come off the side, flip around, and boost themselves independently back to the launch site, and land right back, smack bang, where they are needed to be for the next mission. The center core by this point has already boosted the payload up to such an altitude and such a, uh, a east-west lateral velocity that it would be impractical to boost back and to land at the launch site, and so instead it lands on a fully autonomous drone ship out at sea somewhere. Now, in KSP, as you shall see from the recordings that are being shown on screen right now, I am not very good at accurately landing boosters exactly where I want them to be, so 
I mean, I didn't even consider this going into it, but now that I think about it, landing on a drone ship, no. Not gonna happen. Uh, let's not even attempt that. I can do a quick feasibility analysis in my head. I won't. I'm not good enough to reliably do that. The point of this video is to develop a reusable booster that I can use from here on in the series, and we can improve over time as I unlock more and more parts with the science tech tree and whatnot. But I want to be able to use it, so smack bang, big requirements all the way on top, Harvey, usable, reusable booster. So, instead of landing on a autonomous drone ship, let's land on the nearest continent, you know, the nearest landmass that we could land on to actually recover this thing. Um, and that would be this kind of India-alike continent, if the Kerbal Space Center kind of looks like it's on an African continent, then I guess the next landmass over nearest to the equator kind of a bit Indian, whatever. Uh, not to say that Indian is a continent, just that con- whatever, you know what I mean, you know what I'm saying. Uh, land there. So, as you see over the course of this footage, uh, kind of a graveyard of probes <laughs> begins to accumulate on that kind of landmass, and there's various reasons why they fail, which I'll go into. I mean, you can see on screen, but maybe I'll, I'll mention in a bit. What I'm trying to get at here is which is better for us. We're not going to be able to fly boosters independently, so having, you know, side ones which detach and then fly back doesn't really work in the game. There's a degree of roleplay you could apply to this situation. You could do those boosters individually and quick save before you detach, and then you go detach and you choose to focus on them, you fly them back, you land them back at the KSC. Woo, that was great, we did that, now let's turn back time and quick load and continue as if we, uh, as if those boosters now go do their thing and we carry on with the main center core, and then we take it and do its thing, and then we return to the payload and, you know, imagine or simulate the kind of process we would want to do. Um, a la SpaceX. I would rather not do that, because that takes more time. And also, uh, you know, I'm interested in playing the game, and I'm interested in kind of uh, doing things correctly within the game, and kind of working around the game's limitations rather than role-playing around the game's limitations. Not to say I don't like role-play, I am a big role-player. In fact, coming up on the channel, a big D&D &D storytelling podcast episode with several friends from uni, um, which I really hope you enjoy when that eventually comes out. Uh, check my Patreon for a couple of public posts about that. But yes, I would rather not roleplay, I would rather actually do a mission profile, so we have to choose. We have to choose, do we boost back to the KSC, or do we land on this other continent? Now, the boosting back is only really feasible if your booster doesn't carry the payload up to a particularly high altitude. Actually, it's not even the altitude which matters that much, it's more to a particularly grand lateral orbital velocity that matters, because, you know, it takes way more delta V to boost back along your, you know, original flight path if you do it like that. So, either we use up a booster and cut it out very early on, or we go land on the other continent, and that is the kind of profile that I've I've gone with in the end. Now there's a booster, which does most of the heavy, list heavy lifting, you know, a fully reusable bottom stage, and then there's a middle stage, a kicker, to actually put the payload into orbit. Um, and this kicker stage, uh, I quite like what I was doing, although I've since moved away from using three Poodle engines radially mounted to on the bottom of one big Rockmax tank. I just thought it was a really cool way of mounting, and it let me do this cool kind of stack separator placement. Um, sadly, the thrust to weight ratio wasn't great, and even though those Poodle engines are nice and efficient, it just wasn't what worked best in the end. So, tried with that for a little bit, but then eventually, you know, transferred onto just using the uh, skipper engine, is it called? Which seems to work pretty well. And then from there, actually transitioned into using four liquid engines, because while this kicker... I mean, I say liquid as if the skipper isn't liquid, it is. I mean those four smaller 
Oh, I don't remember what they're called. Those, you know, standard, bog standard, one meter diameter tank fitting engines. Um, the reason I transitioned from using one skipper to using four of those liquid ones actually wasn't as a result of the skipper not being good enough for the mission profile, but more as a result of not wanting to put loads of landing struts around the engine to put landing legs on it and add more unusable mass. I'd rather just land on the engines if I can, so having four is quite a nice kind of leg design. Because yes, this kicker, alongside the bottom stage booster, does want to land back on the ground safely once it's deposited its payload in orbit. So that's about it really. Um, you know, coming back to those problems that I said I was having, there were various. Most of them revolved around my inability to land properly, it seems, but even amongst that kind of subset of Harvey is bad at landings, there were still plenty of kind of interesting different ways. Either I landed in the wrong place, on a hill and fell and died, or in the ocean and just sank and died, or I just touched down slightly too hard on the engines themselves and they combusted, or I touched down slightly too hard on the landing gear that I eventually added and they um, what's the word, compressed and allowed the engine to come into contact with the terrain and thus destroyed, combusted the engines. <laughs> ah, there's many reasons. But in the end, yes, kind of got it figured out and um, ended up with a profile and a ship design which can carry up to 55 tons that I really quite like and I think works really quite well. So we'll zoom through that mission profile, that kind of, this mission craft, which I'm calling the RB50T, whatever, you know, reusable booster 50 tons. Um, it's nice and orange. It looks just absolutely beautiful. Um, <laughs> and it has, very importantly, lots of landing legs, and it has, very importantly, parachutes. My god, parachutes. Now, parachutes, why am I being so annoyed slash raving about parachutes all of a sudden? Well, SpaceX boosters don't use parachutes. Mmm, they're too good for parachutes. And the reason they don't use parachutes is, is, you know, good solid engineering principles. Too much tensile strain on the craft and just wasn't worth it. You know, we have engines, we may, as well, we may as well use engines, let's purposefully land these things. Makes much more sense. Um, there's a really great video by Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, which goes into why SpaceX don't use parachutes, that I recommend. And I recommend the rest of his channel as well, actually. Um, really cool guy really knowledgeable, makes really great stuff, go check it out. Just because SpaceX don't use parachutes doesn't mean that I shouldn't use parachutes. Harvey, what were you thinking throughout all of that development? Some good parachutes probably would have helped. And so this craft <laughs> that you're watching right now, yes, has parachutes on all the stages. And yes, we purposely land just to give it a soft touchdown, but no, we primarily use the parachutes. And that just makes sense in KSP. Like I'm saying, I want to play the game. I want to overcome the game's limitations. Parachutes are really overpowered in KSP, not least because they can clip with each other and that's not a problem. There's no risk of them being tangled up in each other. So I like that. I like parachutes. I like the orange uh, look we can have. I also like the couple of mechanics in the game that I need to give a bit of a uh, reference to. Thank you very much to those of you in the section... That was missing a word. Thank you to those of you in the comments section who informed me about the ability A to... Uh, automatically with stability assist points the craft prograde or retrograde or normal um, and so on and so forth using advanced SAS. Didn't actually do that in any of this footage because I'm using all probes and those probes that I have at this level of the tech tree aren't able to do that but I was doing that with some of the manned flights that I was doing and that was really cool really useful and so I will be using that in the future and there was one other big thing oh of course Having orbital information in the game window without having to switch to map view. My god, that is so much nicer. So much more aesthetic, especially for making videos like this. And just generally so much nicer to be able to work with, uh, to, to circularize orbits and to know kind of when I should be tilting over and, and the kind of launch trajectory to take. Having the apoapsis and the periapsis available in the main game view, mwah, 
I love you, dear video watcher. If you are one of those people who told me about that, mwah, here's a kiss from me. You can have that one for free. <laughs> More kisses if you pledge on Patreon. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. <laughs> But yes, thank you anyway. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was a bit of an interesting dissection of my failures to play KSP and how I just needed to really crack it out and to experiment and to play around a little bit. Uh, due to the weird nature of all these footage and all these different recordings, uh, a lot of these don't actually have, you know, live commentary. As you can see, my webcam disappeared at some point along this journey. Uh, so there's no uncut recording of this process. I'm afraid for those of you who were looking forward to the second installment in the full episode, you know, full show, full uncut KSP series, that will come next time. So if you're interested in watching my KSP Let's Plays in the full uncut version, then you can go have a look at my Patreon. There's a whole lot of public stuff on my Patreon nowadays. I like to post, kind of, keep a bit of a uh, creative writing and video production blog on there now, which you can view, you know, even without being a patron. Uh, but yes, uh, amongst other things, including Discord roles on my Discord server, you get access to full uncut episodes and access to various polls and behind the scenes and so on and so forth if you pledge which only costs you a dollar per month and i would say that's worth it even if you don't do that you know as long as you're watching and enjoying that's really what matters the most so thank you very much for hopefully doing exactly that with this video and I've got lots of interesting stuff coming up. I've got a developer discussion with the guy who made Dark Multiplayer. The man who modded Kerbal Space Program 1 to have multiplayer before KSP2 came along with its flagpole and hoisted its flag and said, Hey, we're doing multiplayer. <laughs> How innovative of us. <laughs> I don't know why I suddenly became really spiteful there. I'm not, I, that's, I don't have those feelings. I just thought it was funny for the commentary. I'm sorry. I'll stop talking now. I have a video coming up with him. Uh, Christopher Andrews, I believe his name was, and uh, that was really interesting, really cool insight into how KSP is coded, so keep an eye out for that. Um, if you find you're missing these videos, make sure to subscribe and ring that bell and all that generic YouTuber stuff. And otherwise, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next video.